Hello and welcome to Dialogue. Leaders in France and Germany are still reeling from the strong showing by far-right parties in European parliamentary elections last weekend. Though Liberal and Socialist parties are set to retain a majority in the EU Parliament, what does the result of the elections tell us about the political dynamics in Europe? How will the changes in seats affect future policymaking in the EU? And what could be the impact on trade with China, especially during a time of EU protectionism and de-risking? Join us for our discussion today, live from Beijing. I'm Xu Qinduo. Joining me today are Professor Meng Jin, Director of the Center for European Studies of East China Normal University, Lorenzo Castellani, Professor of History of Political Institutions of Luis Guido Cali, and Joe Rue, Chairman of the Bridge Tank, and Professor Ian Beck from London School of Economics and P Political Science. Welcome to Dialogue. Uh, uh, Professor Meng Jin, I will start with you. So I will ask you, you know, given the results, some say the establishment, in the sense, the center-right, for example, they have gained the seats. But for others, the center-left, for example, they have lost some seats, the Greens lost the most. But at the same time, we do see some far-right parties are making uh, uh, progresses over there. Are you surprised with the result? No, I'm not surprised because uh, there has been in the air for some time that uh, the right and far right political parties will gain more seats in this coming, uh, in this European election. But on the other hand, I have to say that I'm, uh, I'm glad to see at least uh, the mainstream political groups have been able to secure a simple majority in this ele election. Mm -hmm. Well, Professor Kazalani, what's your takeaway of this uh, election, you know, like 27 nations, you know, 700, 720 seats? It's a bit complex for, for people, you know, watching from outside. Yes, well, uh, the, the growth of the right wing and far right uh, political groups uh, was announced uh, and definitely it happened. So it is not a big surprise, but what we have to look at is not only the composition of the European Parliament, it's very likely that the majority will remain the same, but we have to assess the impact of these votes also at national level, at domestic level, because the EU governance is based mostly on the relationship and pacts among national governments. So the two major events of these uh, elections are, on one side, uh, of course, the defeat of the party of Macron in France and the new elections for the Legislative Assembly in France. These might, of course, influence the political agenda of the presidency and the government of France in the next months. Uh, and the other one is the weakness of the German government that, you know, with the alliance of the German government pulling together uh, slightly more than 30 percent. It is a very low percentage of approval. And then we have a consolidation of the right wing government in Italy with uh, a stronger position of Giorgia Meloni in the uh, negotiation with the other European leaders, relying on a very solid uh, um, electoral results in Italy. So these are the three major events that might shape uh, as well the European governance for the relationship uh, among national governments. Mm. Uh, so, Joe, you are based in Paris, obviously. I mean, uh, from your uh, stance, you know, how big a change you know, based on the result in terms of uh, European politics here? Mm. Yeah, we'll come, to that. we'll come to the national dimension. But first of all, to stay at the EU level, uh, one should understand that with 27 countries, uh, the parliament is a blend. So you might have changes in some countries. Uh, some slides, some surprises in some countries, but as a result, the blend has remained pretty stable. If you compare the current, the new assembly with the previous assembly, you have broadly the same equilibrium of forces. So you might have continuity in the, in the majority, in the alliances. The so-called rise of the extreme right, of the far right, if you see, again, in terms of figures, this is pretty conservative. They've performed a bit more than in the previous assembly, but they stand at nearly the same level. And don't forget, they are divided. You have two main groups of extreme right, which don't want to work together, which compete. You know, it's a saying in the left that 
the, the left parties should not uh, fight the extreme left because the extreme left will fight itself. You know, it's a bit of the same in the extreme right. So I would say that in terms of general trend of policy at the uh, EU level, things will remain the same with two minor qualifications to be discussed. A, this is true that what happens at the EU level also depends a lot on the, uh, the Commission and the balance at the Commission is influenced by the national politics, not just by uh, the EU Parliament. So what happens in two countries, uh, namely uh, France and Germany, are important, and we'll get back to that. And the second qualification, which I think goes against that, is that if you look at uh, so-called Eastern members of the uh, uh, European Union, those countries which have accessed the EU more recently, there is, notably in Poland, there is a downturn for the extreme right, you know, there the traditional parties in many countries in Eastern Europe have had a rise. So that will give for more political way to those countries. And that the end result is more balanced within the EU. So it's also a sign of maturity of the EU uh, and of the European electorate, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Ian, you know, as I said, from uh, outside European Union, uh, people uh, sometimes have a hard time to understand. Uh, tell us more about the European parliamentary election like, you know, the institution and also the purpose of the election and how is it different from, say, individual national parliamentary election there? It's a curious parliament because for many rounds of elections, what's mainly happened is that countries have voted on national agenda. I think you see this reflected in France where the, the win for the center, for the right in, in France reflects the strength of Marine Le Pen's party, the Rassemblement National, which has done well. In Germany, the Alternative for Deutschland, which is the far-right party that nobody wants to cooperate with, not even the other far-right groups, is a relative winner in this. And you see relative losers in, in some of the mainstream parties. What the parliament does is act as a co-legislator. There are two chambers of legislation in the European Union. One is the Parliament, and one is what's called the Council of Ministers, which is the representatives of the individual countries. Now, clearly, if you want legislation to happen, you need both these legislators to come together. Now, what struck me in this is that 63% of the seats, according to the latest projections, are still going to go to pro-European parties. That's the centre-right, the centre-left, the Greens, and what we used to call the Liberals, which is now called Renew. And that tells me, for all the reasons that have already been discussed, that the fragmented groups of, particularly the far right, but also some on the left, really will not have the opportunity to influence European policies to the extent we might even have expected two or three weeks ago. The far right and the far left have not done nearly as well as some of the, as the fears that had been expressed. And what the Parliament also does is to act as one arm of what's called the budgetary, <clears throat> the budgetary authority. That's to say the decision making on the future EU budgets. These budgets are small. They're only around one percentage point of GDP. But the Parliament works with the, the Council of Ministers again on setting that multi-annual budget. What it does not do is determine revenue. Revenue is left to the individual countries. So the Parliament doesn't have the full capabilities of parliaments you'd expect to find elsewhere. It's not like the US Congress, which has a very powerful say on both sides of the budget. But it is an important actor in the European system. Although one other area in which the European Parliament has a lesser activity than in many other parliaments is it does not formally have the right to initiate legislation. That comes from the European Commission. However, the Parliament does have the final say in who is appointed to be the next president of the European Commission. And that remains extremely likely to be a renewal for Ursula von der Leyen. Her party did well in these European Parliament elections. It gained seats. So she will be the lead candidate and she can expect just, I think, to marshal a sufficient majority, that's to say half the parliaments plus one, half the seats plus one, to retain her in position.
Mm -hmm. uh, well, Professor Menjian, you know, we talked about the increase of the seats of the far right parties. Uh, I wonder if can we say you know, there is a trend of the rising far right parties in not all European countries, obviously, in some European countries. And what are the factors contributing to the rise of those parties? Well, uh, indeed, I, I, I have been observing uh, for some time that uh, this trend for the right-wing parties to rise uh, seems to be unstoppable, uh, at least for the moment, because uh, there are a lot of challenges that the EU needs to solve. Uh, for example, uh, the bad economic performance in many of the EU member states, the Russia-Ukraine war needs to be uh, find a solution to, to stop. And also uh, the migration issue up till now uh, is still a, a very big problem in many of the EU member states. Uh, and then uh, on top of that, uh, the uh, transformation, the social ecological transformation, uh, the new policies made uh, triggered a lot of complaints from uh, some of the uh, member states. So therefore, uh, the rise of the far right or the right, uh, radical right parties are directly is directly related to uh, to the fact that the EU is marching from one crisis to another. And therefore, we have to come to the point that uh, the EU really needs to find e effective solutions to, uh, first of all, deal with all these problems before uh, they can say, well, you know, uh, you know, we, we are able to continue as, a, a, you know, a solidarity group, because right now, uh, as some of my colleagues point out, uh, that there are different voices, not only between uh, different uh, radical political groups, but also between all these different groups, there are a lot of differences. And most recently, what is really interesting for us to see that uh, uh, the, um, the alternative, the German alternative party was kicked out by the ID group. And then sometime earlier, the uh, Orban's Fidesz was kicked out by the EPP. So there are a lot of such problems, uh, not only politically, uh, but also you know, practically. So therefore, I see that there is still a lot of concerns among the European voters. Uh, and uh, this uh, election also shows a kind of warning from the voters that uh, if the problems are not dealt with, uh, you know, this tendency for the far right to rise uh, might be the uh, normal, uh, uh, you know, uh, formality uh, mm -hmm. uh, in, in the EU. In the EU. Uh, well, Professor Kazalani, you know, we wonder you know, what's their solution or what solutions uh, uh, do they suggest? I'm mean, suggesting from the far right parties. Probably they have. I mean, they have differences. Probably they have different suggestions. And also, you know, if you look at the age group, do you see there is a differences in terms of their preference in the voting? For example, some say the young voters, like uh, six, you know, uh, 16 to 18, tend to vote for the uh, for the right wing parties. Uh, well, it, it depends, you know, uh, considering the position of the youth is, is very variable. But what we can say, looking at the European map, is that the, there's a radicalization of the youth. Some of them le leaning towards uh, left, particularly pro-environmentalist uh, parties and, you know, uh, identitarian life, left-wing parties, uh, and others uh, leaning towards uh, uh, extreme right parties. Uh, so there's a, um, you know, a hard, harder radicalization of the youth. Uh, then uh, looking at you know, the, the so-called far-right parties or far-right groups, because probably we will have two or three groups, European uh, conservative identity and democracy, and maybe another group with alternative for Deutschland and others. Uh, of course, these groups are very different each other. What they have in common is an idea of Europe not based on, you know, a functional integration that could lead to a European federalism, but they have a more, you know, so sovereignty is nationalist approach, and they are aiming at a, for a confederal form of governance for many aspects. They are all of them against uh, illegal immigration without, you know, a solid protection of the borders. And all of them are against uh, the Green Deal measures. 
uh, but their position is different on many other issues uh, from, for example, the position on the war in Ukraine or the relationship with China or more in general foreign policy and as well, of course, the relationship with NATO and the United States. So this is why it will be very hard to see uh, a very uh, unified cooperation of these three groups during the legislature. But all together, they have, they can exercise a veto power in the European Parliament, for example, on the uh, Green Deal measures in the future. So for now, the power of the extreme right is more a veto power, uh, a capacity to influence, uh, you know, the, the political strategy of the EPP, of the Popular Party, but not to govern Europe, because there are, you know, many differences on fundamental issues as foreign policies among the two or three groups that we will have of, of far right and extreme right. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Ian, can we say there are like, um, uh, say, common priorities in terms of their concern? Their concerns, you know, they have the common concern, their solutions mm. might be different. And before all parties, for example, of course, the Ukraine war over there, Green Deal, energy policy, immigration. Um, so, you know, take that into consideration. Do you think the result of the election will have any impact in terms of policy making uh, you know, for this year or next year? Uh, probably not. And the reason I say that is that we've been concentrating so far in this discussion on left right and saying this is a, a relative win for the far right. But there's a second dimension which is critical to understanding how the European Parliament functions, and that is, broadly speaking, pro European and uh, if not anti-European, at least hostile to some European policies. What we've seen is a, a relative increase in those hostile to European policies. But because nearly two thirds of the par new parliamentarians will be pro-European, they will have the capability to continue with pro-European policies and they will include things like the Green Deal. There's a big question mark over immigration, as, as has already been explained, because immigration is a very tricky issue in several countries, and there isn't easy, an easy solution to it. Italy has a very different view on immigration because they want other countries to share the burden of immigration. Much of the immigration is coming across the Mediterranean and landing in Italy or in Greece, whereas countries like Hungary just want to put up a wall and say it's nothing to do with us. So the, there is very different positions, even among the anti, or the, I won't say strongly anti, but those relatively hostile to the European project on key issues. And I think you have to be always aware of this pro-European, anti-European dimension to it. So I think things like the Green Deal will, broadly speaking, continue, maybe with some trimming. The extent of the veto that was referred to is somewhat muted because with barely a third of the votes, even if all the anti-European parties came together, they're not in a position to block very much. They may have some influence in committees, but they won't have a fundamental influence. Okay, so, uh, I mean, stability is predicted, I guess, in many of the policies there. Uh, but individually, I mean, the bearing on, in different countries, obviously, uh, is different. For example, um, in France, uh, Joe, uh, President Macron has called for a snap parliamentary election. Um, of course, uh, this is a, a called because the national rally, the far right party, has received nearly 32 percent of the vote. Of course, the you know his own party, Renaissance Party, 15.2 uh, percent. Uh, tell us what what does this um, you know vote result reflect the sentiment probably in in France? Well, question we are left to analyze in the coming months but what we can we can vouch two hypotheses one analysis and one hypothesis so far the analysis is that we are at the heart of a collective failure of the elite in convening the message to the electorate about what was earlier in the discussion mentioned as uh, uh, you know the the role of the uh, of the parliament, the co-legislative. It's uh, you know if you look at the last few years, especially this parliament, this previous parliament has done great great contributions into the Green Deal, uh, which was started under the impulsion of the Commission, but the 
Parliament was very central in having the Green Deal completely coherent with new contributions, innovative tools and, and innovative ways of funding. Uh, the budget it handles is small, limited, has a small a cost on nations, but it has a small impact because it has a large regulatory impact. Thereby, the efficiency, if you want, of this parliament is high and its contribution to the dynamism of economies is very high uh, because they don't have to bear the structural cost, you know, of those heavy weight, heavy inertia portfolio like social and etc. Their, their efficiency is mechanically uh, more. And the elites never ever mentioned that to the, the, the constituencies, you know. Uh, the, the, the rebound we've had, the post-COVID package, was also enabled by the parliament. Now, the elites in France, and back to your question, have never uh, underlined the role of the parliament. In the debate we just had before the elections, uh, the extreme right, the far right parties, and there were two, again, trust the far right to divide itself. We have two far right parties in France. Now, the one you mentioned, and there's another one at five percent, and have pushed the debate on national issues, and the ruling elite has been unable to refrain from reacting on the national issues, to rather put the, the, the global, you know, the, the, the European construction. So it's a political failure. Now, what does? President Macron want with the snap election? Frankly, no one knows, but what we can assume is the following, is that he wants to give a chance to uh, the far right not to rule the country. Well, they will rule the country because they will win the elections, but to prove their divisions, to prove their divisions across the two far right countries and within the dominant far right countries, because you have this young uh, upcoming leader, you have the historical leader, so that will create some sort of clash. Now, it's still a dangerous game, and at any rate, uh, this election has been a missed opportunity for France, possibly for Germany, to have a mature approach uh, to a European election and sub substituting to a European debate, a national debate. Well, to the credit and to the benefit of, as I was saying, all the countries which have had a, much more of a European debate. And if this opens a space to other European countries, and if that enlarges uh, uh, the role of Europe, other European uh, countries in the EU construction, well, all the better. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, a clarity, uh, a clearer message, you know, to to the to the mass there. Uh, so, uh, Professor. Uh, Castellani, you know, like, um, okay, we have the European uh, Parliament, the full results will be out. Uh, then, of course, some of their responsibilities to have the, the heads of the Parliament and the heads of the European Commission, European, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the Council there. So European Commission, we mentioned, uh, you know, President van der Leyen, uh, is, many say uh, she's expected to continue for the second term. Uh, from your point of view, uh, how likely is that? Well, it, it, it's quite likely for the reason that was explained before, uh, EPP uh, gained uh, uh, more support than, than, than previously, uh, four or five seats more. So this uh, makes uh, the von der Leyen uh, uh, presidency uh, likely. Uh, of course, uh, it's not sure because the, there are you know, some, some frictions within the EPP and, of course, within the Liberals and the Social Democrats. So we cannot take it for granted, but uh, it, it seems to me uh, likely and possible. Uh, however, if one be uh, von der Leyen, uh, it could be another leader of the EPP, uh, I think to Roberta Mezzola, the, uh, for the president of the European Parliament, uh, or the uh, Greek Prime Minister Mitsotakis. But in any case, what we can point out is that it will be uh, an EPP uh, leader uh, in any case, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, the other parties did not have chance to, to, to propose another candidate in the sense that without the EPP, it's not possible to form any kind of, of majority.
That's true. Uh, Professor Menjim, of course, given what happened, for example, in, in, in France, there will be a, a, another election at the end of this month and uh, uh, early next month. And also in the Germany, uh, obviously, one of the ruling party, the SPD of Chancellor Olaf Scholz, uh, is weakened, you know, coming the third after the alternatives there. And of course, the possible continuation of the role of uh, President van der Leyen. What about what do you see this uh, trade policy toward China? And many people are, talk to, are talking about the possible tariffs on Chinese EVs. Uh, so, what's your expectation? Well, uh, we have to know that uh, even before the European election, China EU relationship is already entering a downward trajectory. The EU has been regarding China as a serious competitor and a systemic rival for some years. And before this election was held, uh, the uh, several uh, political uh, groups in the European Parliament published their manifestos. Uh, the EPP, for example, the Renew Europe, um, the ECR, uh, and the Greens, and all of them in their manifestos uh, targeted China as a, a, a rival uh, a, and uh, criticized China's policies in South China Sea. Uh, in Taiwan, uh, and China's human rights policy is also a target for their criticism. Um, and then for, in terms of trade, the ECR uh, made it very clear that uh, they will follow a policy of uh, de-risk from China. And therefore, I'm not very optimistic about uh, the uh, coming months, uh, the new policies made by the new uh, EU government in relations with China, unless there are some initiatives uh, trying to stimulate uh, positive cooperation between the two, uh, it's very difficult to reverse this uh, uh, downward trajectory between the EU and China. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Ian, uh, of course, we are looking at this possible impact uh, uh, not only in European continent, but also, uh, let's say, in the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, for example, people are looking at the rights of the far right. People say, what will be the impact uh, you know, on the U.S. upcoming you know, a presidential election? Will there also be, say, the rise of the right, or in that sense, the conservatives in the U.S.? No, the rise of the right is already there. Uh, the, the Trump ascendancy is a rise of the far right because Trump has, a, has his own idiosyncratic approach to politics but he's far from the traditional Republican Party which was pro-trade etc so that's already happened but I think we, we may well see something similar in in certain European countries one of the reasons that Marine Le Pen the, the leader of the, the French party which uh, did best in the elections does not want to have anything to do with her German counterpart, the Alternative for Deutschland, is that she wants to be French president. She knows that Macron has only two years left to, to go, so she wants to position her, herself as being relatively moderate compared with some of the, what she would regard as the, the more crazy people on the, on the far right in some other European countries. So you have to always to bring in the national dimension in trying to understand how these European elections and the consequent impact on who is selected for the top jobs in Europe, not just the Commission, but also the, the European Council presidency, the foreign representative. It requires a mix of left, right, male, female, north, south, east for just four jobs. So it's not easy to figure all that out. Well, on that note, we come to the end for today's discussion. Many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinduo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.